How to Stop Worrying and Start Living Name of the Lesson, 8 Words That Can Transform Your Life A few years ago, I was asked to answer this question on a radio program, What is the biggest lesson you have ever learned? That was easy, by far the most vital lesson I have ever learned is the importance of what we think. If I knew what you think, I would know what you are. Our thoughts make us what we are. Our mental attitude is the X factor that determines our fate. Emerson said, a man is what he thinks about all day long. How could he possibly be anything else? I now know with a conviction beyond all doubt that the biggest problem you and I have to deal with in fact, almost the only problem we have to deal with is choosing the right thoughts. If we can do that, we will be on the high road to solving all our problems. The the great philosopher who ruled the Roman Empire, Marcus Aurelius, summed it up in eight words eight words that can determine your destiny, our life is what our thoughts make it. Yes, if we think happy thoughts, we will be happy. If we think miserable thoughts, we will be miserable. If we think fear thoughts, we will be fearful. If we think sickly thoughts, we will probably be ill. If we think of failure, we will certainly fail. If we wallow in self-pity, everyone will want to shun us and avoid us. You are not, said Norman Vincent Peale, you are not what you think you are but what you think, you are. Am I advocating a habitual Pollyanna attitude toward all our problems? No, unfortunately, life isn't as simple as all that. But I am advocating that we assume a positive attitude instead of a negative attitude. In other words, we need to be concerned about our problems, but not worried. What is the difference between concern and worry? Let me illustrate. Every time I cross the traffic jam streets of New York, I am concerned about what I am doing but not worried. Concern means realizing what the problems are and calmly taking steps to meet them. Worrying means going around in maddening, futile circles. A man can be concerned about his serious problems and still walk with his chin up and a carnation in his buttonhole. I have seen Lowell Thomas do just that. I once had the privilege of being associated with Lowell Thomas in presenting his famous films on the Alan B. Lawrence campaigns in World War I. He and his assistants had photographed the war on half a dozen fronts and, best of all, had brought back a pictorial record of T. E. Lawrence and his colorful Arabian army, and a film record of Allenby's conquest of the Holy Land. His illustrated talks entitled With Allenby in Palestine and Lawrence in Arabia was a sensation in London and around the world. The London opera season was postponed for six weeks so that he could continue telling his tale of high adventure and showing his pictures at Covent Garden Royal Opera House. After his sensational success in London came a triumphant tour of many countries. Then he spent two years preparing a film record of life in India and Afghanistan. After a lot of incredibly bad luck, the impossible happened, he found himself broke in London. I was with him at the time. I remember we had to eat cheap meals at cheap restaurants. We couldn't have eaten even there if we had not borrowed money from a Scotsman James McBee, the renowned artist. Here is the point of the story, even when Lowell Thomas was facing huge debts and severe disappointments, he was concerned but not worried. He knew that if he let his reverses get him down, he would be worthless to everyone, including his creditors. So each morning before he started out, he bought a flower, put it in his buttonhole, and went swinging down Oxford Street with his head high and his step spirited. 
he thought positive, courageous thoughts and refused to let defeat him. To him, being licked was all part of the game the useful training you had to expect if you wanted to get to the top. Our mental attitude has an almost unbelievable effect even on our physical powers. The famous British psychiatrist, J. A. Hadfield, gives a striking illustration of that fact in his splendid book, The Psychology of Power. I asked three men, he writes, to submit themselves to test the effect of mental suggestion on their strength, which was measured by gripping a dynamometer. He told them to grip the dynamometer with all their might. He had them do this under three different sets of conditions. When he tested them under normal waking conditions, their average grip was 101 pounds. When he tested them after he had hypnotized them and told them that they were very weak, they could grip only 29 pounds less than a third of their normal strength. One of these men was a prize fighter and when he was told under hypnosis that he was weak, he remarked that his arm felt tiny, just like a baby's, when Captain Hadfield then tested these men a third time, telling them under hypnosis that they were very strong, they were able to grip an average of 142 pounds. When their minds were filled with positive thoughts of strength, they increased their actual physical powers by almost 500%. Such is the incredible power of our mental attitude. To illustrate the magic power of thought, let me tell you one of the most astounding stories in the annals of America. I could write a book about it but let's be brief. On a frosty October night, shortly after the close of the Civil War, a homeless, destitute woman, who was little more than a wanderer on the face of the earth, knocked at the door of Mother Webster, the wife of a retired sea captain, living in Amesbury, Massachusetts. Opening the door, Mother Webster saw a frail little creature, scarcely more than a hundred pounds of frightened skin and bones. The stranger, Mrs. Glover, explained she was seeking a home where she could think and work out a great problem that absorbed her day and night. Why not stay here? Mrs. Webster replied. I'm all alone in this big house. Mrs. Glover might have remained indefinitely with Mother Webster, if the latter's son-in-law, Bill Ellis, hadn't come up from New York for a vacation. When he discovered Mrs. Glover's presence, he shouted, I'll have no vagabonds in this house and he shoved this homeless woman out of the door. Driving rain was falling. She stood shivering in the rain for a few minutes and then started down the road, looking for shelter. Here is the astonishing part of the story. That vagabond whom Bill Ellis put out of the house was destined to have as much influence on the thinking of the world as any other woman who ever walked this earth. She is now known to millions of devoted followers as Mary Baker Eddy the founder of Christian Science. Yet, until this time, she had known little in life except for sickness, sorrow, and tragedy. Her first husband died shortly after their marriage. Her second husband had deserted her and eloped with a married woman. He later died in a poor house. She had only one child, a son and she was forced, because of poverty, illness, and jealousy, to give him up when he was four years old. She lost all track of him and never saw him again for thirty-one years. Because of her own ill health, Mrs. Eddy had been interested in years in what she called the science of mental healing. But the dramatic turning point in her life occurred in Lynn, Massachusetts. Walking downtown one cold day, she slipped and fell on the icy pavement and was knocked unconscious. Her spine was so injured that she was convulsed with spasms. Even the doctor expected her to die. 
if by some miracle she lived, he declared that she would never walk again. Lying on what was supposed to be her deathbed, Mary Baker Eddy opened her Bible, and was led, she declared, by divine guidance to read these words from St. Matthew, and, behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed, and Jesus said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer thy sins be forgiven thee. Arise, take up thy bed, and go unto thine house. And he arose and departed to his house. These words of Jesus, she declared, produced within her such strength, such a faith, such a surge of healing power, that she immediately got out of bed and walked. That experience, Mrs. Eddy declared, was the falling apple that led me to the discovery of how to be well myself, and how to make others so. I gained the scientific certainty that all causation was mind, and every effect a mental phenomenon. Such was the way in which Mary Baker Eddy became the founder and high priestess of a new religion. Christian science the only great religious faith ever established by a woman a religion that has encircled the globe. You are probably saying to yourself by now, this man Carnegie is proselytizing for Christian science. Number. You are wrong. I am not a Christian scientist. But the longer I live, the more deeply I am convinced of the tremendous power of thought. As a result of 35 years spent teaching adults, I know men and women can banish worry, fear, and various kind of illness, and can transform their lives by changing their thoughts. I know. I know. Exclamation mark I know. I have seen such incredible transformations performed hundreds of times. I have seen them so often that I no longer wonder at them. For example, one of these transformations happened to one of my students, Frank J. Whaley, of 1469 West Idaho Street, St. Paul, Minnesota. He had a nervous breakdown. What brought it on? Worry. Frank Whaley tells me. I worried about everything, I worried because I was too thin because I thought I was losing my hair because I feared I would never make enough money to get married because I felt I would never make a good father because I feared I was losing the girl I wanted to marry because I felt I was not living a good life. I worried about the impression I was making on other people. I worried because I thought I had stomach ulcers. I could no longer work I gave up my job. I built up tension inside me until I was like a boiler without a safety valve. The pressure got so unbearable that something had to give and it did. If you have never had a nervous breakdown, pray to God that you never do, for no pain of the body can exceed the excruciating pain of an agonized mind. My breakdown was so severe that I couldn't talk even to my own family. I had no control over my thoughts. I was filled with fear. I would jump at the slightest noise. I avoided everybody. I would break out crying for no apparent reason at all. Every day was one of agony. I felt that I was deserted by everybody even God. I was tempted to jump into the river and end it all. I decided instead to take a trip to Florida, hoping that a change of scene would help me. As I stepped on the train, my father handed me a letter and told me not to open it until I reached Florida. I landed in Florida during the height of the tourist season. Since I couldn't get into a hotel, I rented a sleeping room in a garage. I tried to get a job on a tramp freighter out of Miami but had no luck. So I spent my time at the beach. 
I was more wretched in Florida than I had been at home so I opened the envelope to see what Dad had written. His note said, Son, you are 1,500 miles from home, and you don't feel any different, do you? I knew you wouldn't because you took with you the one thing that is the cause of all your trouble, that is, yourself. There is nothing wrong with either your body or your mind. It is not the situations you have met that have thrown you it is what you think of these situations. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. When you realize that, son, come home, for you will be cured. Dad's letter made me angry. I was looking for sympathy, not instruction. I was so mad that I decided then and there that I would never go home. That night as I was walking down one of the side streets of Miami, I came to a church where services were going on. Having no place to go, I drifted in and listened to a sermon on the text, He who conquers his spirit is mightier than he who taketh a city. Sitting in the sanctity of the house of God and hearing the same thoughts that my dad had written in his letter all this swept the accumulated litter out of my brain. I was able to think clearly and sensibly for the first time in my life. I realized what a fool I had been. I was shocked to see myself in my true light, here I was, wanting to change the whole world and everyone in it when the only thing that needed changing was the focus of the lens of the camera which was my mind. The next morning I packed and started home. A week later I was back on the job. Four months later I married the girl I had been afraid of losing. We now have a happy family of five children. God has been good to me both materially and mentally. At the time of the breakdown, I was a night foreman of a small department handling 18 people. I am now superintendent of Carton Manufacture in charge of over 450 people. Life is much fuller and friendlier. I believe I appreciate the true values of life now. When moments of uneasiness try to creep in, as they will in everyone's life, I tell myself to get that camera back in focus, and everything is okay. I can honestly say that I am glad I had the breakdown because I found out the hard way what power our thoughts can have over our mind and our body. Now I can make my thoughts work for me instead of against me. I can see now that Dad was right when he said it wasn't outward situations that had caused all my suffering, but what I thought of those situations. And as soon as I realized that, I was cured and stayed cured. Such was the experience of Frank J. Whaley I am deeply convinced that our peace of mind and the joy we get out of living depends not on where we are, what we have, or who we are, but solely upon our mental attitude. Outward conditions have very little to do with it. For example, let's take the case of old John Brown who was hanged for seizing the United States arsenal at Harper's Ferry and trying to incite the slaves to rebellion. He rode away to the gallows, sitting on his coffin. The jailer who rode beside him was nervous and worried. But old John Brown was calm and cool. Looking up at the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia, he exclaimed, What a beautiful country! I never had an opportunity to really see it before. Or take the case of Robert Falcon Scott and his companions the first Englishman ever to reach the South Pole. Their return trip was probably the cruelest journey ever undertaken by man. Their food was gone and so was their fuel. They could no longer march because a howling blizzard roared down over the rim of the earth for eleven days and nights a wind so fierce and sharp that it cut ridges in the polar ice. Scott and his companions knew they were going to die, 
and they had brought a quantity of opium along for just such an emergency. A big dose of opium and they could all lie down to pleasant dreams, never to wake again. But they ignored the drug, and died singing ringing songs of cheer. We know they did because of a farewell letter found with their frozen bodies by a searching party, eight months later. Yes, if we cherish creative thoughts of courage and calmness, we can enjoy the scenery while sitting on our coffin, riding to the gallows or we can fill our tents with ringing songs of cheer, while starving and freezing to death. Milton in his blindness discovered that same truth 300 years ago, the mind is its own place, and in itself can make a heaven of hell, a hell of heaven. Napoleon and Helen Keller are perfect illustrations of Milton's statement, Napoleon had everything men usually crave glory, power, riches yet he said at street. Helena I have never known six happy days in my life while Helen Keller blind, deaf, dumb declared, I have found life so beautiful. If half a century of living has taught me anything at all, it has taught me that nothing can bring you peace but yourself. I am merely trying to repeat what Emerson said so well in the closing words of his essay on self-reliance a political victory. A rise in rents, the recovery of your sick, or the return of your absent friend, or some other quite external event, raises your spirits, and you think good days are preparing for you. Do not believe it. It can never be so. Nothing can bring you peace but yourself. Epictetus, the great Stoic philosopher warned that we ought to be more concerned about removing wrong thoughts from the mind than about removing tumors and abscesses from the body. Epictetus said that 19 centuries ago, modern medicine would back him up. Drive G. Canby Robinson declared that four out of five patients admitted to Johns Hopkins the hospital was suffering from conditions brought on in part by emotional strains and stresses. This was often true even in cases of organic disturbances. Eventually, he declared, this trace back to maladjustments to life and its problems. Montaigne, the great French philosopher, adopted these 17 words as the motto of his life, a man is not hurt so much by what happens, as by his opinion of what happens. And our opinion of what happens is entirely up to us. What do I mean? Have I the colossal effrontery to tell you to your face when you are mowed down by troubles? and your nerves are sticking out like wires and curling up at the ends have I the colossal effrontery to tell you that, under those conditions, you can change your mental attitude by an effort of will? Yes, I mean precisely that. And that is not all. I am going to show you how to do it. It may take a little effort, but the secret is simple. William James who has never been topped in his knowledge of practical psychology, once made this observation, action seems to follow feeling, but really action and feeling go together and by regulating the action, which is under the more direct control of the will, we can indirectly regulate the feeling, which is not. In other words, William James tells us that we cannot instantly change our emotions just by making up our minds but that we can change our actions. And that when we change our actions, we will automatically change our feelings. Thus, he explains, the sovereign voluntary path to cheerfulness, if your cheerfulness be lost, is to sit up cheerfully and to act and speak as if cheerfulness were already there. Does that simple trick work? It works like plastic surgery. Try it yourself. Put a big, broad, honest-to-God smile on your face throw back your shoulders take a good, deep breath and sing a snatch of song. If you can't sing, whistle. 
If you can't whistle, hum. You will quickly discover what William James was talking about that it is physically impossible to remain blue or depressed while you are acting out the symptoms of being radiantly happy. This is one of the little basic truths of nature that can easily work miracles in all our lives. I know a woman in California I won't mention her name who could wipe out all of her miseries in 24s if only she knew this secret. She's old, and she's a widow that's sad, I admit but does she try to act happy? No if you ask her how she is feeling, she says, oh, I'm alright but the expression on her face and the whine in her voice says, oh, God, if you only knew the troubles I've seen. She seems to reproach you for being happy in her presence. Hundreds of women are worse off that she is, her husband left her enough insurance to last the rest of her life, and she has married children to give her a home. But I've rarely seen her smile. She complains that all three of her sons-in-law are stingy and selfish although she is a guest in their homes for months at a time. And she complains that her daughters never give her presents although she hoards her own money carefully, for my old age. She is a blight on herself and her unfortunate family. But does it have to be so? That is the pity of it she could change herself from a miserable, bitter, and unhappy old woman into an honored and beloved member of the family if she wanted to change. And all she would have to do to work this transformation would be to start acting cheerful start acting as though she had a little love to give away instead of squandering it all on her own unhappy and embittered self. I know a man in Indiana H. J. Englert, of 1335 Nth Street, Tell City, Indiana who is still alive today because he discovered this secret. Ten years ago Mr. Englert had a case of scarlet fever and when he recovered, he found he had developed nephritis, a kidney disease. He tried all kinds of doctors, even quacks, he informs me, but nothing could cure him. Then, a short time ago, he got other complications. His blood pressure soared. He went to a doctor and was told that his blood pressure was hitting the top at 214. He was told that it was fatal that the condition was progressive, and he had better put his affairs in order at once. I went home, he says, and made sure that my insurance was all paid up, and then I apologized to my maker for all my mistakes, and settled down to gloomy meditations. I made everyone unhappy. My wife and family were miserable, and I have buried deep in depression myself. However, after a week of wallowing in self-pity, I said to myself, you're acting like a fool. You may not die for a year yet, so why not try to be happy while you're here? I threw back my shoulders, put a smile on my face and attempted to act as though everything was normal. I admit it was an effort at first but I forced myself to be pleasant and cheerful, and this not only helped my family, but it also helped me. The first thing I knew, I began to feel better almost as well as I pretended to feel. The improvement went on. And today months after I was supposed to be in my grave I am not only happy, well, and alive, but my blood pressure is down. I know one thing for certain, the doctor's prediction would certainly have come true if I had gone on thinking dying thoughts of defeat. But I gave my body a chance to heal itself, by nothing in the world but a change of mental attitude. Let me ask you a question, if merely acting cheerful and thinking positive thoughts of health and courage can save this man's life, why should you and I tolerate for one a minute more our minor glooms and depressions? Why make ourselves, 
and everyone around us, unhappy and blue, when it is possible for us to start creating happiness by merely acting cheerful. Years ago, I read a little book that had a lasting and profound effect on my life. It was called As a Man Thinketh, by James Lane Allen, and here's what it said, A man will find that as he alters his thoughts towards things and other people, things and other people will alter towards him. Let a man radically alter his thoughts, and he will be astonished at the rapid transformation it will effect in the material conditions of his life. Men do not attract that which they want, but that which they are. The divinity that shapes our ends is in ourselves. It is our very self. All that a man achieves is the direct result of his own thoughts. A man can only rise, conquer and achieve by lifting up his thoughts. He can only remain weak and abject and miserable by refusing to lift up his thoughts. According to the book of Genesis, the Creator gave to man dominion over the whole wide earth. A mighty big present. But I am not interested in any such super royal prerogatives. All I desire is dominion over myself, dominion over my thoughts, dominion over my fears, dominion over my mind and over my spirit. And the wonderful thing is that I know that I can attain this dominion to an astonishing degree, any time I want to, by merely controlling my actions which, in turn, control my reactions. So let us remember these words of William James, much of what we call evil can often be converted into a bracing and tonic good by a simple change of the sufferers the inner attitude from one of fear to one of the fight. Let's fight for our happiness. Let's fight for our happiness by following a daily program of cheerful and constructive thinking. Here is such a program. It is entitled Just for Today. I found this program so inspiring that I gave away hundreds of copies. It was written 36 years ago by the late Sybil F. Partridge. If you and I follow it, we will eliminate most of our worries and increase immeasurably our portion of what the French call la joie de vivre. Just for Today 1. Just for today I will be happy. This assumes that what Abraham Lincoln said is true, that most folks are about as happy as they make up their minds to be. Happiness is from within it is not a matter of externals. 2. Just for today I will try to adjust myself to what is, and not try to adjust everything to my own desires. I will take my family my business, and my luck as they come and fit myself to them. 3. Just for today I will take care of my body. I will exercise it, care for it, nourish it, not abuse it nor neglect it, so that it will be a perfect machine for my bidding. 4. Just for today I will try to strengthen my mind. I will learn something useful. I will not be a mental loafer. I will read something that requires effort, thought, and concentration. 5. Just for today I will exercise my soul in three ways, I will do somebody a good turn and not get found out. I will do at least two things I don't want to do, as William James suggests, just for exercise. 6. Just for today I will be agreeable. I will look as well as I can, dress as becomingly as possible, talk low, act courteously, be liberal with praise, criticize not at all, find fault with anything and not try to regulate nor improve anyone. 7. Just for today I will try to live through this day only, not to tackle my whole life problem at once. I can do things for 12 hours that would appall me if I had to keep them up for a lifetime. 8. Just for today I will have a program. 
I will write down what I expect to do every hour. I may not follow it exactly, but I will have it. It will eliminate two pests, hurry, and indecision. 9. Just for today I will have a quiet half hour all by myself and relax. In this half hour sometimes I will think of God, so as to get a little more perspective into my life. 10. Just for today I will be unafraid, especially because I will not be afraid to be happy, to enjoy what is beautiful, to love, and to believe that those I love, love me. If we want to develop a mental attitude that will bring us peace and happiness, here is rule 1, think and act cheerfully, and you will feel cheerful. Thank you. If you really liked this video then please like and subscribe to the channel.